Uh, actually, yes. Um, I mean, I started out as so many people in Opera do, based on the Saturday afternoon Met broadcasts. And I got Opera News uh, that would have pictures of the productions, and I would make little sets based on those little models of, of taken from those photographs. So that it was always a kind of combination of theater, which I loved, music, which I loved, architecture. Um, but yeah, from the very beginning, it, was, it, it seemed to be um, the thing that I wanted to do. And I did it in high school, and then I did it um, in college. Um, and I was very lucky to, I was at Yale as an undergraduate. And there was no designer. The, the Dramat was a very strong, powerful organization. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, my first job was as an assistant prop man to Dick Cavett. Uh, anyway, uh, they didn't have a, a designer. So I sort of taught myself to design at that level. We, we did productions on the big stage at, in the university theater. And basically, I taught myself how to how to scene paint, how to draft, how to, and there was no one to say no, so it was really like being thrown into the swimming pool, and you know, in order to get to the other side, you had to learn how to swim fast. But it was it was great because again, it, I was sort of teaching myself and working with a very good director directors there and, and good actors on, on serious production, I mean serious plays like Danton's Death and View from the Bridge and, and things like that. So that was where it all sort of came together. Um, but again, yes, it, has, it had been something that had always seemed the perfect thing for me to do. Um, and I went on doing it amazingly enough. Oh no, no, I mean nobody ever invents anything. So. Um, but what was interesting was, this was undergraduate, but we were in the same building um, as the graduate school, the Yale Drama School, and performed on the same stage. And so I um, was doing, you know, and I would do, because again, there was really no one else to do it or who wanted to do it. So I would do, you know, like three productions a year, really starting in my freshman year, surrounded by people who became my friends, who were designers in the drama school, who, you know, got if they, to do one show if they were lucky, and here was this kid um, who got to do all of this stuff on stage. And then my last year at Yale, I was, as an undergraduate, I was allowed to take, uh, got permission to take Mr. Owen Slugger's first year graduate design class. It was the first time I think anybody had done that as an undergraduate. So that was, so I waltzed into this class and I was thinking, who is this Yale, Yaley kid here in the midst of this? But they, those people became very good, good friends. And so I was, um, I seemed sort of part of that world already. And then I went, which was another invaluable thing, Nico Sakharopoulos became the head of the Dramat. He was hired by the he was a teacher at the drama school, but he was also the head of the dramat. And he also ran Williamstown. So I went to Williamstown for summer after summer, um, starting as an assistant designer, to one of the people that I had met at, the, at Yale in the graduate school. So that was another, there was another thing that, where, you know, in those days, summer stock, we did 10 productions once a week for 10 weeks. And it was, again, I worked as an assistant, I worked as a scene painter, um, I worked as a props person, but I also, you know, would run the show at night, I would be in charge of stage left or stage right, or pulling the curtain, or... So again, it was that whole sort of immersion in the total theater experience, um, which I think was great to try to steer me away from just being a designer and thinking of the whole of the whole thing. But again, no, it was, I mean, I really don't think, I, I mean, I've always felt that in a way a designer shouldn't have a style. I mean, that's been said often, but I think it is true. And I try not to have a style. I try to have 
approach things be steered by something in the text or the music that creates a style, makes me, makes me do something. Um, I mean, uh, certainly, if you look over, you know, a body of work, you can find sort of stylistic things. I think probably floating red chairs could be very, um, or at least floating chairs, but particularly red chairs, turn up in a lot of my work. Um, and there are certain, certain things, and I don't know whether this was something that came from, I remember whether I did it in early work of mine, a lot of quoting of ob objects, architectural objects or visual objects, painting objects or things, almost literal quotations from history that are entered in, into the piece. And that's a thing that I have been fascinated by and has sort of gone through my whole design career. But as I uh, sort of emerged as a designer, I, I don't know. I it just it always it always was just the abil the privilege of being able to create a world um, of some complexity and some density often, um, and to be able to um, in a certain way to have the power that a designer has. I mean, I, when I was doing The Ring in San Francisco, I, I, I somewhere in an interview did say, you know, I feel a little, little bit like Ludwig II of Bavaria. Here is this entire opera house, an entire, you know, 80 stage hands, a shop full of, a scene shop full of people, a costume shop full of people, all doing exactly what I want. <laughs> And um, and doing it with great love and affection and care and precision. And I thought, this is, this is, I mean, it's sort of weird and it's sort of terrifying, but it's also, I mean, it's a big responsibility, obviously, but it's an odd feeling that that there are these people who are dedicated to sort of evoking your dream in three in three dimensions and in detail. Now, of course, the dream is is brought forth by work with the other designers and the director and and the piece. But still, it it is this and the fact that unlike architecture or painting, it gets thrown away at the end, which I think is so wonderful. I mean, people say, "Oh, isn't it terrible? You know, don't you feel terrible when that scenery is or the costumes are?" taken away, say no, no, that's part of the, um, partially because it sort of puts it in a relative state, <coughs> I mean, it is just temporary, and the temporariness, the temporality of it, in some ways makes it stronger, because it does go away, and it also exists really exists only in memories. Um, that's why I, I've never been very good or very interested in preserving pictures of my own work or, um, or exhibits of, of work, because it does, it does not exist without the performance and it doesn't exist without the time factor of, of the performance. So the fact that it it can exist so strongly, and then it only exists in memory, um, is to me a kind of fascination, and a, and a kind of uh, puts it all in the right perspective, in the right scale of things. It's it's literal and evanescent at the same at the same time. Paper and watercolor paint and stuff, the same stuff I use now. Um, I mean, it was interesting that, again, it was my instinct was to make models, to do things in model form, not in 
not in painted form. And that's something that's always been useful to me is the fact that I am not particularly skilled as a painter or as a as a um, as a drawer. Um, because again, it's it's trying always to think of the theater in three dimensions and then try to think of it in performance. And a model is at least closer to performance. Um, although when I was uh, at Yale, I took, because I majored as an undergraduate in drama, which was at that point, not many people did that. You got permission and then you were sort of let loose. Nobody was supervising you. So I took a lot of courses in the art school and uh, I actually um, took four years of drawing, uh, which was really fascinating. And at the end of that time, I could, my hand, it was like what I, I if you practice enough, you can play a Beethoven sonata. If you draw enough, at the end of that time, I could almost draw anything. My hand was so uh, attuned to that, but of course that all disappeared. My parents were very, very interested in music, in classical music, and my father played the piano. Um, and my mother had uh, grown up in Boston, outside of Boston, and my grandfather was very connected to, to the Boston Symphony. Uh, and I was taken to concerts um, in Hartford touring orchestras and the, and the Hartford Symphony from a very early age. And they had a lot of um, recordings, so we'd listen to... But opera, I think, was something... I don't know how that happened and my parents were good about it but not particularly enthusiastic they didn't really like opera I mean I, I, it's one of those uh, situations you probably don't want to put this in the thing is a little bit what happens in Boston because my my mother was was a real Bostonian that opera is a bit vulgar uh, as opposed to the classics and the classical symphony or chamber music. So, um, but somehow th they were, you know, they were, they were good. My would my birthday present from the time I was about, well, I guess maybe twelve, eleven or twelve. I got to choose what Saturday afternoon opera I wanted to go to. So my parents would get tickets, and uh, I would go with my mother on the train to New York. And we always had lunch at Schraff's. We always had a club sandwich and a butterscotch almond sundae. And then we would go to the Old Met. And um, see, and I can't remember what the first ones that we went to. I, I know, I remember one of the most intriguing ones was we went to Cozy, the Alfred Lunt production of Cozy, and Eleanor Stieber, who of course had had a big connection with the Boston Conservatory and so on, was singing Fjordlige. So it, you know, through my grandfather it was arranged, we went backstage and went to Eleanor Stieber's dressing room and met her, and I somewhere have a signed picture of Eleanor Stieber's Fjordlige. Um, was she good? She was great. Well, I mean, it was, you know, again, it was Blanche T. Baum and... Yeah. and uh, Richard Tucker. Richard Tucker, Frank Guerrero. Right. And it's really... And it was sung in English. In English. And it's really interesting. You listen, because it came out again. Um, it was recorded. It came out uh, again. Here was, you know, Stieber, T. Baum, Tucker, Guerrero. You can understand almost everything they say. So don't give me this stuff about you know, opera singers can't project English. Um, yes, and I, what were the other ones? I, mem I remember going to see George London as, as uh, Boris Gudinov and um, a whole series of them. So that was, but it was always a kind of, but I guess my favorite story about that and was we went to the Verdi Requiem was done in Hartford. I think the Hartford Symphony. So 
my parents. I said, oh, I really want to go to that. My mother, oh, all right, I'll take you to that. So I went with my mother, and I remember she was very shocked by the fact that the soprano in the performance of the Requiem was wearing a black tight dress that was slit up the side so that you saw leg. And my mother thought that was not appropriate for a religious performance. And I, and I kept all, I still have all my programs and all the title pages. And sometime after that, I was going through that, and I discovered that the soprano was Beverly Sills. <laughs> so somehow that seemed the perfect, uh, perfect conclusion to that story. Well, he was a particularly strong one, because I studied with him very near the end of his teaching career. In fact, I think he retired just maybe a couple of years after I had uh, studied with him. And what he had, I mean, in a certain way, he was not perhaps, I always felt he was not a tough enough teacher. I didn't think he was um, challenging enough, he seemed. But what he had was this incredible enthusiasm for design and for theater. Even at the end of a long, long career where he had uh, done, you know, hundreds of productions, he was still incredibly excited about the idea of theater, the idea of design, the idea of performance. And I remember certainly the, he gave a lecture, um, a talk about Robert Edmund Jones, who he had studied with and worked with. And so you felt you were actually part of a, of a uh, continuum. Jones, Onslager, and then us. That because he felt, he just felt, I mean, he would get so excited and he would get sort of excited about your design and, and so on. That, and he was never bored. He never seemed, he'd never, he'd never gotten bored with it. Um, and that was almost, you know, a great, it was a great lesson about how, how somebody could keep up this enthusiasm for the theater um, through a long, long distinguished career. Uh, and there were many, there were many things about him that were, fascinating and, and interesting, including his, he always gave a Christmas party in his apartment in New York, his beautiful apartment in Fifth Avenue in New York, and he had a set of um, file cabinets, and he would open them up and he would like toss out these bibianas and, and shinkles and things, because he had this extraordinary design collection and sort of, you know, Again, a kind of exuberant generosity, not, oh, these are sacred things. And, um, but I also, a lot of what I did um, taking classes in the art school at Yale, in the graduate art school, and there was a very uh, famous class taught by Neil Welliver, who was a painter. It was called Basic Design. It was a first-year class that everybody took. Um, but there, the challenge, he was, you had certain problems or th materials that you had to use or certain th things that you had to discover. The, the challenge of being able to think out, to, to think things through and to explore and experiment and not be afraid of experimenting, but still consumed with the desire to do well. Um, to, to, to figure this out. That was a very important um, uh, lesson. I mean, I think that my mentors are more about attitude rather than direct influence. It's, it's, it's people who 
retain their kind of curiosity and excitement through a long, over a long career. Oh, yes, yes, I think that's always one of the things that teachers should be doing. I, I again, because I don't, tr I don't try to, to teach people things. I don't try to teach them, I mean, to a certain extent, you can pass on knowledge about techniques and um, technical, technical, technical things, which is a fact, but I don't try to teach them, I don't try to, I couldn't and I don't try to teach them how to design, I teach them how to, th how to ask the right questions, or how, what are the questions, and, and again, to, to expose them to a system which demands attention and demands commitment. And that that's what designing is. It isn't, again, it's not a style or it's not a way of doing things. It's a way of thinking and a strong emphasis on on the dramaturgical aspects of, of a script rather than that is what seemed to be this seemed to me to be almost or often superficial design surface narrative aspects of a piece to be able to go deeper and to have them overcome often their um, I mean, there's a lot of talk about how these are graduate students at, at NYU, talk about how unprepared they are in terms of their cultural references or their knowledge of, of, of history or architecture or, or, or even theater. Um, and I refuse to go down that route because I feel that they have, as everybody does. It's the same way about audiences, too. Everybody has the equipment to understand what seems complex artistic expression. Because it doesn't come from knowledge, it comes from feeling. It comes, it's expressed. Your, your acceptance or your understanding comes from within you. Yes, what you've known, what you've experienced, but also who you are. And, it's a, and everybody is a person. So that if you can um, tap into that and let them feel that they can go into themselves and that they, that they're not daunted by the material. They're not um, thrown by it. They're not, they don't feel inferior to it. That again, that it's just, it's that sense of each thing is an individual moment, an individual response, an individual um, connection. And that it exists at millions of different levels and different levels within people at the same time. So again, that's what I, I, I guess, what, what those teachers taught me and what I try to not teach them, but to um, bring out in them. Are you a mentor to any? Not so exactly, and not, but, but there are certain, um, yes, I mean, some my students, <laughs> um, who I do keep up with and 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 see, um, but I, yeah, I don't. Um, I think I mean, and at Glimmer Glass, there were you know assistants and so on that were. So I was in a mentoring position, but I was always slightly uncomfortable with that um, because again, I just think it's it's a matter of. And the best thing you can do for people that you're mentoring or, or who are you're teaching or whatever is to make them unafraid. 
um, unafraid of their own feelings and unafraid of their ability to do things. And um, so, it, I mean, it becomes almost more like a therapist than a, than a, than a teacher. And that's probably, that's probably good. Well, I think it's because, to me, that is, to me, that is the sort of raw, my raw material, um, and has always been. Now, I grew up, I mean, I guess everyone thinks they grow up at the right time, but I grew up, I mean, I didn't, we did not have a television set in my house until I was like 15. So I grew up with where you read, where my parents read to me and I read all the time. And it just, all of that becomes a kind of raw material that I demand for myself, that I, I demand of myself. I don't, I don't do it for a purpose exactly. I just do it. Um, I did have a, a friend, um, acquaintance, and she was. She said she'd been asked to do her first opera, and it was going to be the Magic Flute, and she wanted to know what she should, what books to read, and I said, you know, what I think you should do is do absolutely no research. Just listen to it and just read the text and do it. I mean, that's one extreme, but because I don't think that necessarily knowing a lot is useful I, in general. It's useful to me because that's the way I work, that's the way my mind works, which is to take, synthesize things, literal things. Um, but I don't agree that that is, that is um, the only way to do it, um, by any means. But it is just something that is, and I, as I said, I think the greatest quality that any <coughs> artist or anybody in the world can have is curiosity, because it will just keep you, leading you further and further and enriching your life further and further. But again, I don't think that's the only... I mean, this whole question about it... It's interesting because I'm writing, uh, supposed to be writing, or have to write, an article for Kelly for the Opera Mary magazine, which is about these two conflicting things. You should know a lot when you go to the opera, and you should know nothing. Um, and how does that... What do you do about that? Um, but I think that's a that is a an increasingly serious problem because of the amount of times that we are told what to think, and even worse, thinking that we need to know to have somebody tell us what we should think about something. Um, and that, to me seems a sort of death knell of the experience. On the other hand, a richness of what? A richness of the sort of cloud of richness of knowledge that you might have also helps you. So I don't know. It's a it's a and I think it's a it's a real question for people who are trying to work with audiences. Um, with the hated word education of audiences, um, people who are teaching, um, people who are in general trying to engage in the art experience, how to, how to sort this out. Well, I think it is that the music does not have a text an overt text. I mean, I, I am also of the, you know, having grown up in a, 
later on in this sort of postmodern crit critical world of challenging text that text does not always or never means what it says um, so that the the firmness of the meaning of text is 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 already um, unstable or ambiguous but music just lets you forces you when you have to deal with it it forces you to go someplace beyond words um, which is useful it, it, or, or liberating or intriguing and unstable and I'm sort of a believer in that the tension that arises from instability is a very powerful and creative force if if treated in a proper manner or, or dealt with in a, that this desire to have meaning a fixed meaning is um, tends to limit the experience rather than focus it. So I, I appreciate that music drives you away from the easy answer. Even though I now feel the text is not an easy answer either, and, but it appears easier. Um, so that is, again, I mean, it was interesting, I just did, I don't know if this is useful to talk about, but um, I just did a thing for the Lincoln Center Directors Lab, which was about, they were doing Strindberg's Dream Play, well, you know, which has an unstable text of an extreme nature. But what I was dealing with was music in, and how to, um, how to use music to make it even more ambiguous but still keep it focused. I mean, that's, of course, the problem is if you, if you make it too ambiguous, it just flies away into meaninglessness. But if you can, and if you can, I not even say train an audience, if you can let an audience experience the power of ambiguity in themselves, the pleasures, the pleasures of ambiguity in themselves, then they will just inevitably, it will be a richer, experience and music music just perforce does that you you, you have to uh, you have to deal with it somehow even if you don't deal with it intellectually your psyche has to deal with it and that I find fascinating I'm trying to think if there was an opera I wouldn't design first of all because I've I've, I've taken on, sometimes I've taken on projects of pieces that I didn't particularly like. I mean, I think of Sweeney Todd, which, which is actually a piece I dislike. I was offered to do it, and I thought, all right, now I'm just going to do it. And, because maybe, I, maybe it will force me to learn something about it. And in that case, I ended up loathing it even worse than when I started. <laughs> but, but the thing is also that it just like goes away, right? I mean, you do it and it goes away. And so um, I think I would always, I can't immediately think of a piece that I wouldn't do. I mean, there are certain directors and, and designers that I wouldn't work with, wouldn't willingly work with again, usually, um, because I don't feel that they are curious enough or rigid, or not rigid, uh, rigorous enough. And they seem to want answers too soon or even to believe that there is an answer, which always is a questionable point. Um, 
what I do, something that has happened, of, of course, in one's career, is that there's that moment in which you get to be the oldest person on the team. And that's a strange, because I never feel that. But, so I like working with, with new people who are inevitably like young directors or young designers. And because, again, you never, you never know. I mean, it doesn't, just, you wait for things to happen. You wait for fun things to happen, interesting things to happen. And sometimes they, they happen in all different combinations of circumstances and and uh, I mean I'm I'm doing a play at um, at the public theater Love's Labor's Lost with Karen Coonrod which was is in their Shakespeare workshop so it was already a small budget and then it's now been cut like in thirds and so Karen said do you still want to do this you know and I said yeah because we're working on the play with actors I mean, it doesn't make any difference, ultimately, what you, um, what you have to spend. I mean, I've always thought it's re the system is all sort of screwed up because when you're a young designer first starting out, you should have lots of money. And then as you get older, you get, have less and less money money because you need less and less and less be because or or because you begin to trust the energy of the performer and of the event rather than stuff um, so I'm always interested yeah in exploring almost anything that's interesting trying to think of, of a piece or an opera that I really wouldn't the higher the ambiguity level of a piece, it seems to me, in a certain sense, the higher its artistic value is. So that pieces, you never, you never do a definitive production of a piece that depend, you know, depending on the piece, but that, you know, as Pierre Boulez says, each production is a sort of proposition about the piece, and it exists only as that. I mean, when, when I first was asked to do The Ring in San Francisco, I thought, you know, how are we, how are we going to do this? I mean, what, what do you do with The Ring? Um, it is so complicated. It is so um, rich and, but finally it helped to have the realization that you weren't going to be able to really do it all in no way. So you just do what you want to do with it. You commit yourself completely to, a, to an understanding of it as best you can, as you are now in San Francisco and whenever. Um, and that's what you do. And then it's over with. And then you do, and I did another one in Chicago with a different director, which was completely different. Um, these pieces just have so much in them that they are endlessly, I mean, the great, great, rich pieces, that you can endlessly do them. Um, I mean, over the years I must have done, and I'm working on another one, you know, like 10 cozies. And I would never not do cozy because I know it will teach me something. And I'm totally different than I was a year ago, or I'm totally different than I was last week, actually. Um, so that... I don't know, I like coming back to, to pieces and, and um, seeing what happens. I haven't done that many, actually. Well, uh, 
because of, well, actually, this is a sort of an interesting story. Mark Lamos and I did, were asked to do a production of uh, Dominic Argento's um, The um, Voyage of Edgar Allan Poe. And it was the, it had originally been done by Wesley Balk in Minnesota. And I think this was, this was in Europe, in, in um, Gothenburg, Sweden. So we said, sure. And um, we totally ignored the basic, in a way, the basic narrative visual premise of the opera, which it all takes place on this boat where Poe is on a journey from New York to Baltimore and dies. We ignored all of that and we set it in a, in a sort of surrealistic 19th century operating room. And so, so we, you know, we did this and it was going along fine. Then we had the final dress rehearsal and they said, oh, and Mr. Argento is going to be there. So I thought, oh. Christ, you know, what's going to happen now? I mean, he's, because we, he had not been involved. He had known nothing of this, of what we were doing. He, so he was sitting there in the center box and um, he said, and then uh, they came and said, uh, Mr. Argento would like to see you, <laughs> Mark, up in the, up in the uh, green room. So I thought, oh, uh, well, here we go. So we went up and he s said, also a real gentleman. He said, I learned more about myself from this production than anything that I have seen of mine. And I thought, now there is a compliment. Because I've always felt that one of the things that is the problem with In a certain way, you don't want to work with a composer of a new piece. You want, because to a certain extent, that person doesn't know what he's doing on a conscious level. So you don't want his conscious level mucking it up. You want us, the, the singers, the actors, the designer, the director, to delve into this thing and mine up things, which is what Dominic saw. He saw things about himself and about the piece that he never would have, I don't think he would have allowed us to. Now, I, this story has a sad ending, and I don't know whether you want to, but because of the success of this in his mind, he, he was next doing a, uh, the premiere of the Aspern Papers in Dallas. And we were, Mark and I were asked to do it. So we thought, hmm. And it was, you know, in a certain way, the libretto was a little bit awkward and it was, it was going in and outside of this villa and we thought, well, maybe it should just be all taking place in this, you know, big room that's like flooded. And, and Dominic, I mean, he is a true, true gentleman. He wouldn't let us do it because he thought it will be confusing. The people, the audience won't understand unless you deal with the surface narrative. I wanted to say, but Dominic, now wait a minute. You just saw a piece of yours in which the surface narrative was ignored and existed only in the, we didn't change the music or the text, but, and now, but it was because it was a second performance and it was that he felt it would not make sense. So instead of not doing it, which is what we should have done, because 
Dominic's a nice guy, and we wanted to do it. And it was you know with Flicka and Elizabeth Soderstrom, so who's who? Who are they not to work with? Um, but then there's another thing we knew, and Richard Stilwell wasn't. We knew these people were in it, and that they would do it. You know, Soderstrom and Flicka can. They can do all of that. They don't need to do tell you the surface narrative dutifully. Um, and it was not successful. Um, because it seemed sort of clumsy. It, 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 it just seemed narratively sort of clumsy. So that was, I thought... And then, of course, we heard about another production that was done in Europe by somebody else, where it was done like in a white room with flooded white room, and it was a huge success. So I, I just wished, we had a little, you know, I just, I, I don't know, I don't, that's why I don't do a lot of new work, or, or it's not that I don't want to, it's just that I don't, I think it's better to mine it out of the piece and then, and also, the, these productions are not going to be, this is not going to be the only production of, now, of the Asimov Papers. Dominic's point was that it was going to be the premiere, and in this world, if the premiere is not successful, perceived as successful, then perhaps it will not have much of a life. Um, so, I mean, there is, there is that point. When it's working, Again, you, I mean, you say you get to the end event, um, and you cannot say whose ideas these were or where these things came from. They just they come out of that. The best directors are wonderful designers, and the best designers are great directors um, because it's all the same thing. It's basically the same thing that you were um, you're creating a space and an atmosphere and a physical embodiment where the interaction of the actors or singers and the music and the text can live, grow and expand and explore. So that it doesn't it doesn't um, It isn't divided up into sections. And I think that that has changed, that has become more apparent. I think the, in a certain extent, the growth of the autonomy of the designer has increased over, that they become dramaturgs. And they become, to a certain extent, directors. Um, because it's all so inter related and interactive and um, that it must be like that. Any production is a very volatile and complicated sort of chemical lab experience and you have certain elements that you put into it and it's how you balance them and how they work together and sometimes they will produce gold and sometimes they'll blow up in your face. But the, I mean, I, I don't know whether a designer or director or conductor or even the singers have a role to play. They are just part of this thing, which is a very amorphous thing and tender and um, difficult to nurture and to make it grow, but it just, it, um, I mean, in great productions, you don't say, oh, the director did this, or oh, the conductor did this, or you just say, and in productions that don't reach that level, they start to break themselves down into component parts which didn't work together. 
And so therefore you think, well, this is... But I don't think that... Um, I don't think one person can be dominant unless the other people are not doing their job or are not rising to the occasion. Of course, it's, then it's going to start getting distorted. But, and it's incredibly hard and difficult to make everything just work together in a kind of seamless intensity. So mostly it doesn't happen. I mean, that's mostly. So, but I, 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 I think that the, the argument that it's a director's theater and it's a conductor's theater or it's a designer's theater is often true, and that means there's something wrong. Well, I would say, as an arbitrary and controversial statement, that no opera should be performed in, the theater, in a theater space where you wouldn't do a play. Um, now, plays have been done at the State Theater. They've been even done at the Metropolitan. But it, it just seems to me that there is a physical fact that in spaces that are bigger than maybe the biggest should be is 1,500 seats, the performance does not actually happen. It's not, it is not able to be perceived. Because if you cannot see, almost if you can't see the expression in an eye of a performer, then you can't see the performance. Now, opera is strange because vocally and musically, yes, I mean, it will, and it says, you know, I mean, the worst seats, the furthest away up in the balcony are often acoustically the best. But you cannot... Um, You can't really do a performance. You can't do a performance that would be perceived at a correct level. Which is why I think, although this has happened, you know, before with Live for the Men and so on, why the HD broadcasts are so... Because there are close-ups and you can see the expression of the people's faces. And you know, the music all gets strange, and the equation gets strange. But the very fact that you can see... Um, I mean, I, I you know, didn't go to the Met to see Armida, and then I saw it because I thought, well, it's not, it's not whether I want to do this. Um, and I happened to be looking at it on the, on the television. It was not on HD, but it was that broadcast. And the close-ups of Renee singing the mad scene in the last act was, to me, completely compelling. And I thought, you know, I wouldn't have seen that. I would not have seen that performance. I would have heard it, but I would not have seen it um, if I'd been sitting in the house. So it makes me very nervous and depressed to work in big houses. Glimmer glass is 900 seats. So you can actually see it. You know, you can actually see the performance. Um, uh, I don't know what you do about this. You do HD. I mean, as everybody is discovering, you do in big houses, you do, you somehow get close ups. I mean, I had a, a, a friend who goes to all of the HDs in. She's a theater person in Madison, Wisconsin. We went to Salome. We were sitting in, at the Met. We were sitting in good seats halfway back in the orchestra. And to the end of it, she said, I just, I didn't get it. It wasn't, it wasn't getting to me. I didn't know. All I was looking at was a long shot. And I, I couldn't get it. I just didn't feel anything. So I thought, well... 
So what's happened? <laughs> what does this mean, actually? Is this the real revolution of opera? Is this the real turning point where, because, I mean, there's always been television operas with close-ups, um, but now it's become such a big phenomenon that is this, I don't know what anybody's going to really do. And I don't, yeah, not a very useful answer, but. No, not so much worried. I mean, I, I've become, you know, allied with the uh, Boston Lyric Opera as an artistic advisor and then as uh, uh, doing a lot of designing there. And my hope was, and maybe my hope still is, that because of the economic situation, opera companies are not going to be able to afford so much stuff. Stuff or stuffing, as the case might be. And that stripped away, given, given a, again, keep talking about the audience or whatever that, and whatever that could possibly, whoever that is and what it could mean, that audiences, and then I hear this all the time, audiences want stuff. Uh, they feel cheated when it looks as though, as though it, when it's stripped down or when it's just... Now, and I thought, well, now, maybe because everybody is forced to do this, the audience will realize that stripped down means clearing the underbrush the distracting underbrush from this experience because what you don't cut out is the singers and the music. Uh, that maybe then they'll say, oh, well, you know, actually, I sort of like this better now because I'm not full of scenery and full of stuff. Um, which has sometimes happened in the problem is with that is that then what you have left has got to be really good and really focused. And, and I was talking to them in Boston about you can cut back on the scenery and you can cut back on the props and the costumes, and, but what you cannot cut back on is the rehearsal. Uh, because, in fact, if anything, you need to add rehearsal anyway you should do that because there's because of that you can't cut back on because you're going to be left with the performer in space and the performer has to know what he or she are doing really no not just sort of superficially no not just be blocked not just know their music they have to really know what they're doing and because um, I was even talking to them in Boston I said you know would it be what would happen if we took away from the production budget and added a week of rehearsal. That that might, in the long run, be more valuable. But he goes, oh, but you know, then it's going to look just sort of empty. He said, if it's a week more rehearsal with a performer who's operating at full tilt, it's not going to be empty. But you have to show that to people. They go, oh, it's not, oh, I see, it's not empty. But if it's not quite there, they go, it is empty, and they're right. So, I mean, I, 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 I hope that this will happen. But it's, it's, it's hard, because, I mean, the problem is, I mean, you know, 90% or even 95% of all work is bad. <laughs> Uh, including your own. I mean, it just that's just what what happens. So, and you can't blame the audience for not sorting it out. That's not their job. Their job is to be there to experience what you've given them. And if you don't give them, if you don't really give them something, 
then they're going to say, you know, I'm bored, this is second rate, I don't like opera, I'm not going to pay money for this. And you think, oh, that's right, that would make sense to me. So I, I, I am apprehensive, but I keep thinking maybe this is actually going to push. If you can do it, I mean, Boston has a really nice theater. It's a tiny bit too big. The second level is too, second tier, second balcony is too far away. So, and that's, of course, where the seats are that a lot of people can afford. So it's all very, it's, it's, it's complicated. What I always believe in is the power of the performer and the power of the audience. And those things will never go away. You have to develop it, or you have to um, let it exist. But that's, you know, so there's always hope. But I, this whole technical thing, and, and again, I just keep coming back to this whole HD thing, which I can't decide whether that's good or what is the, what is the, I guess wonder whether the whole, say this, which is like total heresy, whether the value of it being live is overrated. I mean, because I because of this the whole question, I went and I bought. All right, I said, okay, so I'm going to see if I buy a seat in the front row of the Met, which is, so I can get as close to a close up as I can of um, Boris. You know, I still thought, you know, I can't really see anything, I can, you know, I can sort of, then I saw it on HD, and again, when you saw close-ups of faces, you thought, okay, so I don't know, and, and, I mean, live sitting in the front row of the Met was not that great, I didn't think, in terms of commitment to the total dramatic experience. That's like heresy to say that. Well, because I think that a theater space designed stage is not a narrative, necessarily. It is not a story-telling um, device so much as a kind of energy field. So that, like a chemical experiment, you think, all right, now if I put this in, what happens? What would, how does it change? What, what, what is the dynamic? Because you're not disturbing the narrative. You're, you're, you're introducing another element into, a, into an energy space, which will create a different energy. Um, I mean, uh, we, this never happened, but I, at NYU, I so hoped this was going to happen. There was, they were doing two productions, side-by-side, -side, real productions, in upstairs in the, in the drama department. One was an Alan Ackborn play, which was set in an English country house, uh, cottage, a weekend cottage, which was designed in very real, realistic terms. And the other was Three Penny Opera, which was done with lots of piles of newspaper. And that was, was all. So I thought, now, it'd be interesting if one night you switched productions and you sent the cast who were used to performing this English comedy with, you know, tea tables and curtains and staircases and chintz sofas, 
in a pile of newspapers and you took the three penny opera people and put them into an English cottage. Right at the last minute, you didn't tell them that this was coming at all. You know, it would take them like a couple of minutes and they would suddenly, the piece would morph, the set would morph, and it would start absorbing the energy of the piece in a completely different physical environment. That because they were both charged spaces and they were charged with with certain I mean that Ackborn obviously had a narrative charge and the other one had an abstract charge, but even that that you could switch. That to make people because I mean the theater should be sort of shocking in a good way, you know, it should, it should, it should, um, and, you know, these pieces, operas, aren't like really strong, they're like tough customers, you don't need to be like, oh, delicate and, you know, fragile little thing, I mean, Bohem and Butterfly and Go to Damarung and Cozy are like really tough customers, and they I also sense that they also love to like move someplace else and see what it's like for them to do that. Because they have energy. You so you put an energy thing and you put it in another energy thing and it will it'll create something. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I almost convinced the director of of um, Three Penny, which who is Rhoda Levine, who's an opera director, to do this, but no. Um, but I again, it's that principle that you, and you also like sort of play around. It is. I mean, I keep coming to that image of a of a chemistry thing where it's fascinating. If you put one drop of something, it will change the whole thing, and you're not quite sure what it will do or what it's going to do, but it will, sometimes it'll blow up, but sometimes it'll produce something completely unexpected that is different than each of those two things and you put them together. And So again, it's a little bit, to get everybody thinking, not thinking, not, not to just sort of play around for play around's sake, but to play around because that's how you learn. I think it just all comes together. I mean, uh, many, it doesn't happen so much anymore, but a lot of times designers worked in white models, which were white paste-up models, to the theory that you figure out the form and then you add color. Mr. Onslager worked a lot in, in white models. That always seemed to me a sort of false premise because, I mean, color is form. It just, I, I, the thing is to sort of start big and then you just keep working at it and it becomes more and more focused and more and more. You don't start and then add this and then add that. You, you start with a big picture, a big space, a big, not necessarily a big idea, not even a big idea. You just start with, but that's why I always work in model. I mean, sometimes I do some sketches, but basically because, you know, you do the gesture that I'm doing just now is that you sort of, you sort of fill it up and then you keep looking at it and refining it and, or it leads you. It, it you know, it, it starts to tell you what it wants to do and not tell you what it wants to do. I mean, I'm always wait for that moment in a production. It happens sometimes, but not all the time. It's when suddenly, and it happens on stage in tech and stuff usually, where it will start to, the production will start to tell you what to do. Um, because it has an, or, like, an or, like a chemical thing, it has an organic event. It's when you also put the singers in. I mean, it's why we are doing that more in Boston, but we did that at Glimmer Glass too, which is to have the costumes at the first tech. So you, so you have lights, costumes, and unfortunately, the one terrible thing about opera is you don't get the orchestra until too late. 
or until late, too late maybe, because I mean one of the first rules that I'm con of my own that I'm constantly ignoring is don't make any decisions based on the piano dress, because when you hear it with the orchestra, exactly the same thing is going to be totally different, because. You can't add an element as strong as an, as an orchestral sound into a thing and have it stay the same. But by that time, it's too late to really make changes. And so that's one of, the, one of the real problems with organic opera production, is that you, you don't have time. You have to see everything together and see what it does, not what you told it to do, and not what you thought it was going to do necessarily. Although some, you see what it does, and then you go, "Oh right, mm -hmm. yeah, we should." Now it's telling me to do this, and it's telling me to cut that, and it's telling me to cut that light cue, and or put another light cue in here, or and you and you can't do it because the time's all run out. But of course, it's not actually speaking to you. So how? How does a production... Oh, it does speak to you. you. Oh, it does. It says, that dress should be red. And you... It, and you don't even talk about it. You know, you usually don't even discuss it. Why should it be red? You know, which you would do earlier on. Oh, she's going to wear a red dress. Right? You go, oh, yeah. And then usually you will say to the director or, or be together, um, yeah. I mean, I remember once on it was not an opera production with Mark of um, Pericles and at Hartford, and there were all of these yellow um, rocking chairs that were part of the design. And there was a little rocking chair upstage. And I, I, I don't see the rationale as to why there were rocking chairs and why they were yellow and everything. Got it in together. And at the same moment, and it had run for a while, was running for a while, Mark and I looked at one another and I said, you know, what should happen at the end is the little rocking chair should just go up in the air like 10 inches. And he said, you're absolutely right. So we did that. We never talked about why at that point, or it just, it was saying, the little rocking chair was saying, you, this thing is telling, it's just got to have that one thing. And what I want to do is go up in the air eight inches. And so we made it go up in the air and it was, and it was, and it was the last thing. So it was a hugely crucial move dramaturgically. And, you know, I mean, it was the final image was this gesture. And yet, we never, I mean, it sounds sort of new age and silly, but it really did say to us, do it. And don't, we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to discuss it. We're not going to say, what does it mean that it does that? We're just going to make it happen and go home. Well, there was, um, we were doing, um, with Nick Muni, I was doing um, Trovatore in um, Seattle. Was it Tulsa? I think this was started in... I did do one. No, no this was in Seattle. Okay. And um, there were scene shifts, and this, there was a front black curtain that came in, Scene shift happen. So the at one point in rehearsal, they brought in the border. They made a mistake. They brought in the front border instead of the black, so that it came in and you saw over it. And they said, "Oh, we're sorry, we're sorry." They said, "Whoa, whoa, wait a minute, hold on." Do you think this looks really interesting like this? Um, because you were aware that things were happening, but you couldn't really see them and instead of break. So I'm a big fan of accidents because um, it, 
I mean, if if you saw the production, you would have you might have said, "Oh, it's really interesting how they do the transitions with this, and they must have worked really out." It's like a complete uh, accident, except that again, the per when it happened, the production said, "I want to do it this way. Look at this. This is the way I want to do it." Now you you wouldn't have been able to say that or see that or or anything um, until that moment. But it was late on, It was so it was all in you. Now, I mean, you have, to, you have to see the accident, most of the accidents you don't see, right? Because they just happen to you, it just looks wrong. But this was, but you always have to be aware that there are, you're not steering it anymore. It is, be, it is steering itself because you have added in the intangible to you when you're planning it, the intangible intensity of performance and the duration of time that happens. And, um, and the sense of space, a real space, an auditorium space. You just don't have those, and so you, you, they're, so they, they sort of are running it, and you just got to let it go where it wants to go, and see where it wants to go, and help it sometimes get there. Sometimes it just is exactly what you had always planned, and it does exactly what, I mean, I've had, I love sitting in the theater, I love, it. and just, you know, in load-ins and things, because I keep thinking People say, well, why, John, you don't need to be here. Why don't you go back to the hotel? And, you know, and we're just, you know, or even focus. I think, you know, I just should sit here because I'm going to see things that are, that I want to see happen. Or something is going to occur to me. I remember sitting in, in, um, at the ring in Chicago. I was just sitting there and they were, I don't know, doing what. I thought, I wonder what would happen if we flew that drop upside down. And uh, so I went to Drew, and, it, and he was so used to this. I said, Drew, I said, how could we, could we do that? Could we fly that drop upside down? And instead of saying, why didn't you think of that idea a long time ago? Because it would have been much easier to do it. Or, what do you mean? Why are you doing it? Or he said, yeah, sure, we'll make that work. Uh, and again, I mean, I don't know what, what Everding it was August Everding was thinking what he thought. But I said, August, well, let's just try the, can we try the drop flying it upside down? It was a mountain, a realistic mountain. So he, flew. he said, well, yeah, yeah, I guess, why not? Um, so again, those are all, but I just like to sort of sit there because you, you need all the time for this to kind of morph in your mind and change and, and just, let the organic dynamic run it for you. Did you keep the drop upside down? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
but spate was you know always challenging and 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 I think that's good because he was and he was also there all the time, so it's not like he sort of waltzed into the you know first piano dress or the orchestra dress said, well yeah, I don't like that and you know. Uh, yeah, and and you know that's like easy to do, because they. It's interesting to me that there is a constant desire for the students, for the NYU students, to know about opera, even though they have may in some cases never even heard it or been to it. Even just the idea of it is something that turns them on instead of turning them off, which is what you sort of think um, young people dismiss opera as old-fashioned. Um, so I am constantly encouraged to simply present them. I don't need to teach them. I don't really even need to teach them to respond to it. I just need to give them a chance to respond to it. I mean, they simply have not had a chance. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, again, this whole business about, oh, they haven't, you know, they don't have a frame of reference and they don't know this and they don't know that. And I just think, you know, who cares? But what they need is, is it given to them an opportunity to hear it, again, without fear. Without fear that they don't know enough, without fear that they're not going to understand it, that it's, you just, you know, it's like a therapist. You just say, all right, and everybody just like calm down. Just go. And I, you know, I remember once, I remember what it, it was again at NYU, and where I played, we listened to Madame Butterfly in class, really basically the whole thing. And they were following it along, and at the end of the class, everybody was weeping. And this was not a DVD, this was a CD, it was just the music, it wasn't a performance. I mean, how hard is this? This isn't hard. This is not hard. That's why I think, you know, interesting, conversation about what, you know, people's first opera should be. You know, young teenagers or, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, it should be the Barber of Seville or, I said it should be like Wozzeck. They would, they would completely understand Wozzeck because they wouldn't know that they weren't supposed to understand it, that it was hard, difficult modern music. It's just about this dysfunctional family and a lot of angst. That they know. That they understand. And that they'll respond to. I mean, it's the more the contemporariness of it, I think, is... I mean, I think they have more trouble listening to Mozart than they have to almost any other... Um, Although I do remember at one point at NYU playing them the love duet from Tristan, and it drove them, or their response, it drove them completely crazy. They just thought, who are these people endlessly yelling at one another? Um, on the other hand, I would play them um, the messengers. Uh, from um, Orfe uh, from Orfeo, the the death of Eurydice, her narration. And I just remember again somebody coming up at the end of the class with like tears running down, saying, "This is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard in my life." So you think this isn't hard? Is it the right thing delivered in a way that they don't that the baggage as much of the baggage is taken away, the fear of the culture is taken away, they'll go right there. Anybody will go there. I mean, not just NYU students, but Boston matrons. And, and um, 
it's not hard. That's the one saving grace. That's what I was saying. The one thing that we have left, no matter the whole economic nightmare, is you have the event, the music and the text, and you have the performance. Singer and orchestra. Singers and orchestra. That's all you need. If they're performing at a correct level of intensity, which is the hardest thing to do. So it's both very easy and very hard. But you've got to trust it. And then you just don't need stuff. Well, I had the, certainly the extremely formative and extremely lucky experience of rather Early on, when I was, I guess, I guess I was a junior in college, I went with Friedland Wagner, used to run this program called Masterclass, Masterclass, which was a bizarre and fascinating experience. But, and she was a fascinating character. But we went first to Berlin. She was a friend of Felsenstein. So we went to Berlin and we saw productions at the Commissure Opera, his famous productions. We saw Traviata, uh, Cunning Little Vixen, Othello, Tales of Hoffman. And then we went to Bayreuth. And she, um, Wieland and she got along fine, Wolfgang and she did not get along at all. Uh, but so I saw Wieland productions. Um, I mean, when you saw things like Tristan with Nielsen and Vingassen and Neidlinger and uh, Christa Ludwig and Hans Hauter, you thought, in this incredibly seemingly simple visual world, you thought, this is it. Um, and then you saw the Feldenstein, which were very detailed, and, um, and, uh, and they were also um, they didn't cancel each other out. They only revealed the amount of difference that could still be effective. And I suppose those still remained in a certain way, and I was just, it was particularly the Vilond ones that, you know, again, the Parsifal, where, you know, the set was a plat was a circular platform in this big space. The platform was, I don't know, nine inches high. That was it. And when somebody stepped up nine inches, it was like climbing a 30-foot staircase. But the other thing was that when you saw those Vilan productions with Vilan there and you saw them rehearsed, rehearsing, I mean, Nielsen, he would go up on stage, in the Tristan, he would go up on the stage and he would have these conferences with Nielsen as though he was directing, you know, Cherry Jones and the heiress or something. I mean, and she, it was all specific you felt, and so that in this stylized general world, the musical and dramatic things were incredibly human and acted as well as sung. You thought, this is why this sort of abstract Vilan, when Vilan wasn't doing, you thought you could just reproduce this. You know, you, all you need is a big space, you put a circular platform and they don't move around a lot. But he was there just talking to Nielsen and Vingossen and, and Hotter. Just, you know, long sort of conferences on stage. It's just, and you thought, this is why this works. Not because it's abstract, but because it's cleared all of this stuff away. And the performers are totally focused and totally immersed. I mean, Nielsen's performances at Bayreuth were completely different than what she did in New York. Uh, not, not intentionally, 
But I think because she didn't have me on there each day, say, period, you know, you do and you know. So those, I guess, were, I've always, I mean, I've seen, you know, I guess, I don't know, one of the productions that was the most interesting that I saw for many reasons was Nick Heitner's Xerxes. And there was, a, there was a production, it was done before titles, but it was sung in English. And I went into it and I thought, oh, Xerxes, and I did absolutely no research or, or um, thing. I said, Xerxes, that's got the Largo. I, you know. so, so I went in and I thought, well, now I'm just going to, I'm not going to read the program. I'm not going to read the synopsis. I'm not going to read the program. And I'm not going to find out who is who. Just, it's going to start. And it was the most, in a way, the most enthralling evening I've ever spent because there were a million things going I had to really listen because I wasn't being fed the text. I had to absorb the text from them. I had to follow the plot, but I didn't know what the plot was. So there were all these moments where I think you say, oh no, what is she? She's going to take the letter and she's not going to give it to him. And that means he's going to think that she is doing this. Don't do, is she going to do it? No, she's not going to do it. Thought, this is, and I had to figure out who was who. Thought, who's this? Oh, that's the king's brother. Oh, I see. And he's in love with her. And meanwhile, this very conceptual production, which was partially set in the 18th century and partially set in Assyria, or an 18th century view of Assyria was going, a very conceptual, fascinating thing. And I was as absorbed as, and you were listening, and luckily the Largo is the first thing you hear, so you get that out of the way, because um, you never knew what they were going to sing or what it was going to be, or what kind of an aria was it. So it went on, and you think, oh, it's this kind of an aria. Oh, my God, no, wait a minute. Now it's turning there, and now she's saying, does she really mean that? Is that? And then she goes off, and you, you thought, this is what it's like should be like, because the fact that I didn't know the story made me listen to the music more, not less. The fact that it was a very conceptual production, which you were also sort of, oh, how witty, yes, he's coming out and it's a topiary Assyrian lion. You just absorbed that all. It just, you were so, your mind was so keyed up and it was so pleasurable because it was, so it was a Handel opera. It was beautifully sung. It was, you know, a witty production. You thought, oh, why can't opera be like this all the time? But part of it was not knowing the story, literally not knowing what was going to happen and being concerned about what was going to happen. There was also true, uh, I saw a production of Gazzaladra, Rossini, which I didn't know, and I went into it the last minute and I knew the overture again. And at the end, it was just, you know, again, a compelling story. At the end, they take her off and because they think she's guilty and they're going to kill her, shoot her. And so it goes off. And the magpie comes back in with the stolen fork, which is what she has been accused of stealing. And the guy on stage sees it, takes the, runs off stage, and you hear shots. And you think, no. No, Rossini wouldn't, he wouldn't do that, would he? Would he actually kill, have her kill? And you were just like, what? and then they come in and of course, he got there in time, they shoot off their rifles in celebration and it all ends happily. But you just thought, you, know, you just, and you think that's what he wanted. That's what Rossini wanted is to, I mean, imagine going to Bohem and not knowing whether she's going to actually die or going to Butterfly and not knowing what's going to happen. Really not knowing what an amazing experience that would be. Was it Pesaro? I, I guess it must have been with titles or something. I was sitting... Francesca got me in at the last minute because we were there working on something and 
she was doing something there, and she, it was the opening night, and we were walking by the theater, and um, she said, you want to go see it? I said, sure. So she rushed to the box office. She said, here, run. Here's a ticket. Run. So I got in, and I was sitting in the row of critics, of Italian critics, dressed in a sweaty T-shirt, a sweaty T-shirt, and because it, it was like 110 degrees, too. And, I mean, it was a wonderful performance, too. It was Ricciarelli and that so on. But the critics, the Italian critics, were all sitting there going. And occasionally they would look, look at one another and they'd go. And I thought, oh God, these are the people who are driving our destiny. But it was, but again, it had that the completely un, almost unrecognizable feeling of not knowing what was going to happen. The power of the narrative to, to, to illuminate everything rather than distracting you. So, but that's, I suppose that's what new operas should be like. If they were good. And if they didn't publish the synopsis in the program and they didn't talk about the damn thing forever, um, that, well, I don't know. But it, it, it's how to get that primal experience back into, I, and I don't know that it's possible. I mean, we're certainly lucky in opera that the standard repertory is all wonderful and can be um, so I've always thought it would be an interesting idea if you could do it and you didn't, you could get it so it was a complete surprise so nobody ever told. You did Bohem backwards, did Act 4, Act 3, Act 2, Act 1. It would suddenly make it all strange and different. Oh, I'm not so sure, because I have, I mean, I'm sure I've told you, but this experience at Glimmerglass, where this, we did Don Giovanni, mm -hmm. and uh, this uh, man came up to me after a performance, and he was like bright red, and his, you know, his blood veins were throbbing in his throat, and I thought, oh my God, he's going to have a heart attack, and it's all going to be our fault. He said, I just didn't understand anything you were doing in that, Don Giovanni. He just said it was just, you know, it was incomprehensible to me. He said, why was he in a wheelchair? Was it because he had syphilis? It was, and he went on and on and on. And I said, oh, this is not I said, now, wait a minute, could I just, just interrupt for a minute? You said you didn't understand anything in this production, and yet you have just given an extremely interesting um, exegesis of the piece. And he said, well, is that what you meant? And I said, I, doesn't make any difference. It's what you felt. And, he, you know, he sort of... Called. And then he said very quietly, he said, you know, I think maybe I should come back to this production. I thought, there's, there's the great triumph. It's again, you just need to be like a therapist. You just say, look, calm down. You own this piece. We don't own it. And indeed, Mozart doesn't even really own it. It just is there, and then you own it. And what you make of it is what it is. And people, they say they don't understand. I mean, it was true. He said, I didn't understand anything you were doing. It was totally incomprehensible. And he had a very, very clear idea of what he had seen. He just wouldn't let himself see it feel it. He didn't think he was worthy enough or whatever to do it. And as soon as I gave him permission to do it, he went, oh, oh, well then, yeah, okay. Then maybe I did like it. See, that's the thing is that they don't, you know, I think most people of any kind are in some sense bored by the theater and are bored by opera. I think a lot of people that work in opera are bored by opera. Um, but it's what it is, you know, and it's what it's always been, and it's what it, I guess, that means that's what it should be, and that's what I expect, and, but, 
But, you know, somewhere I just think they're saying, you know, I expect it and therefore it's sort of boring. But if you... But now I see something and I go, oh my God, I'm not bored. And in, if you can just let them feel that that's okay. See, it's again, it's fear. It's like, the, it, I think not seeing the conventional makes them fearful. And you just want to say, there's no reason to be fearful. Just, 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 you, just, nothing's going to happen. Just honor yourself. Honor your, your, I mean, human beings are human beings. They're very, this, there's no such thing as a simple human being. Everything is complicated in different ways. And I just think opera makes them fearful. Even though they've been to a million operas and the opera fans, I think they're fearful too.